Welcome to the Christ Connection Podcast. We are here to help and encourage you to enjoy your adventure with Jesus. I'm your host, Kevin Senapati Ratna. Let the journey begin. Well, welcome to the 16th episode of the Christ Connection Podcast. My name is Kevin Senapati Ratna, and I normally don't like to start off uh, this with kind of a date attached to the episode, because my goal with these uh, podcasts is that you can listen to it five years from now and still get a lot of value out of it. But today is going to be an exception to that. Today, when I launch this episode, is my daughter's 12th birthday, Samantha, our only child, turns 12 and so I wanted to kind of highlight that uh, because for the first 12 years or 10 years of our marriage uh, Jen and I uh, didn't have any kids the doctor actually told Jen that she could never have kids but so Samantha is an answer to prayer she's an amazing young lady with a heart for God Uh, for 12 she's got amazing insight and wisdom a lot of fun to be around (laughs) sometimes uh, at some point I'll have her on the show and we'll just chat and you'll uh, see we have a good time Uh, but for today and let me just say a happy birthday Samantha uh, now back to the regular scheduled program <laughs> uh, it's an honor to have my guest today uh, my guest is Dave Butts uh, president of Harvest Prayer Ministries along with leading this ministry for the past 25 years he's also chairman of America's National Prayer Committee which I'm a member and a whole bunch of other committees if you look at his bio he's got a lot of things going on um, Harvest Prayer Ministry it helps churches and individuals in their prayer life. Uh, Dave is the author of multiple books, including The Devil Goes to Church, which we talk about, and Pray Like the King, with he did he did with his amazing wife, Kim. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy the, his depth of perspective from his years of ministry, whether you're just starting out on your walk with God, or have been walking with God for a long time, or even are a pastor or, uh, leading a church. We get into that a little bit, uh, of, uh, how to have an effective prayer ministry. So without further ado, my conversation with Dave Butts. All right, Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Uh, and just as we get started uh, before uh, this, uh, I would have already given all the, uh, the details of your uh, bio and things like that. But on a personal note, I just wanted to say thank you for your leadership of the National Prayer Committee. Uh, it's in the last few years, it's been an honor to, to be a part of that group. And I've appreciated your leadership. Yeah, we so much enjoyed having you a part of the National Prayer Committee. And I got to tell you, that's just one of my greatest privileges and you know i am i am in awe that i get to do this uh you know i i just came back from from a meeting our annual meeting you know about 75 national prayer leaders and that i get to kind of help guide that it's just an amazing thing and i'm grateful to god well and i i, I gotta say I, I mean i'm the newer guy last few years and i i just love how uh, i mean it's such a diverse group of people uh mm-hmm. and your uh, your ability to to navigate that and still move us uh, into god's presence and going uh, going after something is uh it's a testament to your uh, your grace <laughs> and your uh, mm-hmm. uh and yet at the same strong leadership so uh, thanks for that well, thank you uh just to kind of set a, a framework for our discussion uh, today i was thinking about because you've got such a wealth of and years and years of experience for in prayer ministry uh if we try and think of two specific type of people and see if, how, how much we can help them in our conversation the first would be a newer christian who is mm-hmm. just uh, uh you know prayer may seem intimidating kind of a big thing and not sure how to tackle that but on the flip side would be that christian who's walked with God for a long time uh, and maybe uh, feels like, oh yeah, prayer, why even, why even, <laughs> why even talk about prayer? Uh, we, we all should know how to pray. And uh, uh, So maybe a good question to get us started. Uh, what has God been teaching you in the last maybe year, a few years that maybe has stretched your thinking in the or, area of prayer? 25 years, maybe. I'm still learning. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yes, to just keep teaching me. Uh, well, you know, there's there's several things there, and I think that my answer would actually fit both both uh, ends of the spectrum here: the brand new believer and and the one who's maybe been walking with Jesus a long time. Uh, 
none of us are natural prayers. None of us just just wake up one day and decide we're going to be a great man or woman of prayer. Um, we're, we're, I think there are people who are more inclined towards prayer, but, but even those folks, just like the apostles, uh, came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. We need, we need help. And so I think that if there's one thing that I would tell the brand new believer and I would tell the saint who's been hanging on with Jesus for a lot of years is, is pray that prayer of the apostles. Ask for help. Uh, I I lead prayer ministry. That's all I do. I, I tell people I have a I have a great ministry. I get to talk to God, and I get to talk to people about talking to God. Okay, that that's what I do for a living. But what I want to tell you is, every day of my life, I say, Lord, help me. Help me to be a man of prayer. I need help. Why why wouldn't we come to God for help? Why why do we think we're so spiritual? I can just do this. I'm going to develop a 40-day plan, or I'm going to develop this, and I'm going to do this from this time to this time, as though those sort of things, as helpful as they might be, are going to make us a spiritual person who has a, a connection with God. And so I really believe that the most important thing God's taught me through the years, ask for help. You know, Hey, uh, I, I'm not very good at this computer stuff, and you're 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 pretty good at that. And so, if if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna look for someone like you to come and say, Kevin, would you please help me? I, I don't know how to do this in computers. I don't know how to do this. I'm trying to connect this, and it doesn't seem to work for me. And you look at it and go, oh, Here, you just do this, boom, and then you make this connection, and things happen. At least in theory, it happens that way. <laughs> but you, when you find that you are you know, lacking in something, you go to someone who knows what they're doing and you ask for help. So when it comes to prayer, there is nobody like Jesus who gets prayer. I mean, think about it. Jesus is the only one who gets prayer from both sides. <laughs> True. <laughs> he was fully man and he prayed and you see this great model of him, you know, over and over again praying, but he's also God. And so he gets prayer from that end. Okay. So man, if you want an expert, you could Lord, help me be a person of prayer. And I believe he does that. I, I always tell people, you know, when I pray a prayer like that, I don't get zapped. I, you know, I'm instantly a man of prayer. But that daily coming to him saying, Lord, I need help, causes me, me every day to experience something from him that draws, draws me near and allows me to experience more of his presence or to discover new ways to pray. And I don't even know what those are. It's just know that he does that, that he teaches me those things. So I guess I don't know the answer to this. Uh, how, how did you get into prayer ministry to start with? What was the, the journey uh, to get there? Uh, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. It's a long answer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in one, in one sense, I grew up in a Christian home. And I don't remember ever not praying. So, I mean, that's... That, that's the a basic answer in one set. I, I, oh, you know, I remember as a child laying in my bed at night praying silly prayers, you know, and as I got more aware of, of sin and not having a good understanding of grace, you know, I'd pray things like, oh, Lord, help me to, to take care of anything I might accidentally sin while I'm sleeping, you know, so I can pray, you know, and just silly things in a sense. <clears throat> and then, you know, you just continue to grow in prayer. But here's, here's what did it for me that moved me from a prayer to a, a teacher on prayer and a prayer, someone who is, I would call a prayer mobilizer. I was pastoring in a local church, and prayer was increasingly important. I was teaching on prayer. I was discipling men in prayer particularly. And I was invited to a, a task force on missions within the fellowship of churches I was working in, in independent Christian churches. And this was back in the late 1980s. And they were gearing up for the 1990s as a decade of missions. Okay. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of denominations were doing that. Looking at the 1990s till 2000 is this final push for world evangelism. And I was invited to this. And it was interesting, there was about 25 individuals there, and they were all missions people. 
they were mission professors, they were mission agency leaders, and there was one pastor, me. <laughs> and I, I listened all day, and I was excited by all the things they were going to do to elevate the level of missions and mobilize for that. And, and middle of the afternoon, I raised my hand, asked a question that would change my life. I just said, where's prayer in this? Wow. And they jumped all over it. I mean, in a good way. They're going, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. We don't want to take that for granted. And so we start talking about what we need to do. And I walked out of there being their national prayer chairman. <laughs> wow. and, uh, I said, so, so let me get this right. Uh, we've got about uh, uh, 6,000 churches in the U.S. And you want me to mobilize them for prayer for world missions? And they said, yeah. Yeah. So, so I continued on pastoring, but I took that very, very seriously. I began to study. I was mentored by men like uh, David Bryant and, and, uh, and Bob Yawberg, others you wouldn't necessarily know, but who, who really poured themselves into me and taught me more about prayer than I ever dreamt possible. And this was geared towards world missions. And so during that time, I, I was growing in this and becoming aware that I needed to do this full time. And uh, so by 1993, we were ready to go into that. So Kim and I uh, launched Harvest Prayer Ministries in 1993. We just we celebrated uh, 25 years this wow. past year of uh, full time on the road, traveling, teaching, writing, uh, and uh, and love it. I'm looking forward to another 25. And at my age, that's something. <laughs> but, uh, if the Lord tarries, uh, why not? Right. We'll just keep Keep doing this. You know, there's always the need to mobilize prayer and, and for me to become more and more a man of prayer. Has, have, you, have, you, have you felt like the landscape has changed a lot since you started 25 years ago? Absolutely. It, it really has. Um, 25 years ago, uh, people said, you've got, a, you've got a what? You've got a prayer minister? What's that? Uh, people didn't have they, there were a few, but they were a few. They, they were not at all common. Um, but, but now I can give you uh, virtually a booklet of, of uh, people who have their ministries. And the other thing that was that's a huge shift for me is I have a real focus on a local church. I really want to see a local church become a house of prayer for all nations. But when I looked at 25 years ago, 26 years ago, to try to find a church that even had a prayer ministry, that was exceptionally rare. But today, I would say a significant number of churches have organized prayer ministries. Now, are, are they where they need to be? Of course not. You know, then I'd be out of a job. <laughs> but, but they're moving that way. There's a, a, a much, much more recognition of the need for an organized focus in a local church of prayer. We can no longer assume that the church is going to be a house of prayer. Well, yeah, we're Christians. We pray. That's what we do. No, that's not true. And so, uh, so God's raising up in congregations everywhere and understanding of what it means to be a house of prayer, and we got to do something intentionally to make it happen in a particular congregation. That's a huge shift. Hey, I wasn't necessarily going to go here, but since you, you brought it up, if you were to see kind of what's going really well from a local church standpoint, is there certain, uh, and I, I know you teach on this, probably a whole seminar <coughs> kind of a thing, uh, but if, if you were seeing maybe two or three things, maybe there's a pastor listening in on this, that uh, they could do to galvanize their church as a house of prayer. Would you, what would those two or three things be to start? I know it, yeah. beyond bringing you in to do a whole seminar. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. And there's a few more churches that I can get to. Uh, right. I live another 25 years. Uh, there, there are a couple of things. Good question. The, the first thing is realize that most people don't know how to pray. You see, that's a, that's an assumption uh, that that uh, most pastors don't make. They don't they don't think in that term. They say, well, you know, I'm I've done a series on prayer and this and this. They know how to pray. Take time, talk to people, and when it comes right down to it, most people in America 
feel woefully inadequate in their prayer life. They don't feel like their prayers are effective. They don't feel like things are happening. And if you don't feel good about something, you're not going to give yourself to it. You know, if the, if the pastor says, let's have a prayer time, and you don't feel good about your prayer life, why would you go to that? Because you feel like you're going to be embarrassed. You don't, you don't feel good about your prayers. And so <clears throat> and when I tried to analyze my own years as a pastor, and, and I know I did a number of series of sermons on prayer, and I'm thinking, why would those people still say that they don't know how to pray or they don't feel good about their prayer life? And I realized something. We pastors are typically exhorters. We encourage people. We tell them, you know, a three-part series here on how prayer is important and how powerful it is and how it will change your life and all the things, and those are all good. What we don't do very well is train people in how to do it. We're not typically trainers. So I find it fascinating that when the apostles came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he didn't give them a sermon on prayer. He said, okay, pray like this. And then he gave him an outline. I mean, people don't always look at the Lord's Prayer like that, but he really is. <clears throat> Here are the elements for significant prayer. And so I really believe that that's where we need to go. We need to look at, at the teaching aspect as probably the most important thing we can do. <clears throat> if you simply try to set up uh, some prayer meetings and you try to think in terms of uh, <clears throat> why don't people come to these meetings, you're, you're, you're going to fail, I think. Um, now, that's, that's the second thing I would want to say. And that is, in our nation, because we have a tendency to privatize our faith, prayer for most American Christians is a private thing. And uh, you'll even get people misuse Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. They're saying, well, we need to go into our prayer closet. I don't need to come to pray. And that's, of course, a misuse. Jesus was doing corrective teaching about the Pharisees who had public prayer that was devoid of significant meaning. It was all about a show. That's what Jesus was dealing with. He wasn't talking about public prayer because Jesus prayed. You know, so, so he obviously wasn't teaching against that. But American Christians want to go home and pray. They don't want to come together and pray. If we're going to see, and I'll just tell you this, I believe with all my heart, if we're going to see revival again in this nation, it'll happen because the church overcomes its fears and its inhibitions and learns to come together to pray. That's where the power is. Wait, and you see, you see a lot of prayer meetings out there. Uh, and you, I see on Facebook, you're, you know, this prayer meeting, this gathering uh, uh, there. Uh, is there two or three elements that make a prayer meeting uh, one easy for someone who's uncomfortable with prayer to get involved with uh, two uh, that makes it, you know, have a life to it. Uh, that Yeah, absolutely. Because most prayer meetings are dead. Okay. As someone once said, they're like organ recitals. People come in and pray about this organ and that organ, you know, all <laughs> to do with physical issues, you know, and, and so those things are destined to fail. There's only a handful of people who, who will stick with that because they know they need to. Uh, but if you want to see a growing dynamic prayer event at your church, it needs to be planned. And I know that sounds that sounds hard for people who say, no, 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 just let the Spirit lead. Well, what I've discovered in my sermons is that the Spirit leads best in my sermons when I spend time preparing, <laughs> when I understand the text, and I'm able to communicate it in a good way. I've spent time studying that, preparing for it. Well, I want to tell you, leading people in, before the throne room of heaven is as important as any sermon. But very rarely do I find a prayer leader who takes time to prayerfully consider what are we going to do this next hour and to plan it out. So, so what you need to consider is the fact that um, most of the people, if you can get them to come to a prayer meeting, and that's another whole thing, getting them there. But if you can get them to come, you need to recognize that you have a whole group of people that are nervous about being there. They don't feel good about their prayer life. 
but their pastor either guilted them into it or somehow excited them and got them there. So to do that, you've only got a couple times there to, to, in a sense, hook them and to keep them there. To do that, you take an hour per meeting and you divide it up and you move it quickly because one of the biggest problems people have, if they go into a darkened room and sit there for an hour, you know, man, they're, their minds are wandering, they're dozing, they're all over the place, thinking they wish they weren't there. So you take three minutes and you pray over this. And then you take two minutes and go over here. Then you've got a map of the world and you say, okay, we're going to go up over here and we're going to lay hands on this country and do this. And then we're going to sing this song and then we're going to read this scripture and then we come back, we're going to pray for this. And then we're going to go over here and sing this song. And then we're going to lay hands on one another and pray for our needs. And then we're going to focus again on our neighborhood and you're going to do that in, in, in three-minute, five-minute, six-minute segments. And you break that up through the course of an hour. And I guarantee you, at the end of an hour, people will walk out going, I cannot believe I prayed for an hour. But you have to plan it. And now it's under the Spirit's guidance. I know for me, when I will plan out a meeting like that, almost never does it end up exactly the way I plan it. <laughs> it's like a sermon. Okay. I can plan it out, but the Spirit is invited to come in and to change things. But the Spirit loves to work through my plans, not my non-plans. That's His preference, always. I think we need to recognize that. Well, uh, I think, I think we, what you're saying for the new person coming in, that those short breaks, I mean, sh keeping it moving helps them to say, oh, I can do this. It's, oh, yeah. uh, as, whereas opposed to... Uh, I think it was Dick Eastman talked about, he went to some prayer meeting when he was first learning how to pray and uh, they gave him an hour and uh, five minutes in, he was all done because he didn't know what else to pray for. That's exactly the case. And most people feel that way. Uh, and sometimes not just brand new believers. Sometimes people <laughs> who've been at it for a lot of years and they're going, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. And so we help them. We, we plan this out. The other thing that I've found good for having a, and this particularly helps getting people to a prayer meeting, is that as you begin to announce it, as you begin to put it on the calendar, let people know, have a clear focus for that meeting. So it could be, let's just say you have a monthly prayer meeting on the second Thursday night of the month. So the first month, it's gonna be on world missions. Second month, it's gonna be on families. Third month, it's going to be on revival. The fourth month, it's going to, you see what I mean? You know, so you have a real focus there, and people know. Now, one of the things that happens is people will be drawn to a topic that they already like. So someone might say, you know, I, I, you know, I, excuse it, but I've been around <laughs> church people enough to know. You know there, someone say, I don't want to pray about world missions. I'm interested in that. And so when it comes to praying for their neighborhoods, those people will show up because they're interested in their neighborhoods. Someone else says, you know, I'm a single person. I don't want to go pray for families. But, man, when they talk about revival, I want to be there for that. And so, But what happens when they go to the ones that they like, they get hooked simply in the whole prayer gathering. And later on, regardless of the topic, they start showing up because that's become important to them. And they understand that it's not just sitting in a room with your eyes closed and your head bowed trying to stay awake, you know, that you're doing something, that this is, sometimes you're up physically moving around. Sometimes you're telling people, hey, we're going to take five minutes and we're just going to walk. We're going to walk and pray. And none of you are going to fall asleep because you're walking, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just things like that that you do, that you get people moving. And, you know, and there's a lot of ideas out there. You can get it on the web. There's all sorts of things. But I, I really believe that, that planning having a clear focus, you know, having things for people to do and keeping it by the way to an hour. Oh yeah. yeah. Now there are, there are, there are prayer warriors who can pray for hours and that's great. But here's what I've discovered. This, this is where being in something for 25 years helps. My best guess is about 5% of a congregation or what I would call prayer warriors. About 5% are those who, are given to prayer. They love it. You know, they'll, they'll go to anything that's prayer. 95% are our audience. Right. That's what we're really working for. The 5%, you got them. They'll come to things. We got to work towards the 95% and get them there. 
when I hear you say about an hour, I, boy, one of my most co- uh, popular blogs is uh, 10 reasons people don't go to prayer meetings. And uh, one of those is uh, uh, because you don't have an end time attached to it. Because <laughs> right? if they know that, if they don't know when it's going to end, they're, they're not, they're figure they're going to be stuck there for four hours or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And you know, sometimes I feel funny, you know, if I've got people you know, they're really praying away and, and, and I, I've kind of given five minutes to it. And, but I'll, sometimes I'll go six or seven, you know, a little extra. But, but I will just step in and say, hey, be, please be bringing your prayers to a close. Right. And at the end, unless the spirit is clearly moving and you just know you've got to let it go, I most always, you know, I'll just interrupt people's prayers and say, folks, it's time to bring our prayers to a close. We're going to go home. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Uh, you, you've got to have the boldness. A leader has to have the boldness to do that. Well, you do that at uh, our national prayer committee meetings too. <laughs> so yeah, you got you got you got a room a full of prayer group. people. <laughs> That's a hard group to get them to quit praying. Uh, speaking uh, at one point, you said uh, you're hooking people. Uh, going back to that individual who maybe they're listening and they uh, they've prayed for a while, but they. I mean, they they know Jesus. They they want to serve Jesus, uh, but the hook is kind of lost in their prayer life. Uh, any advice to kind of uh, revitalize? Because uh, it's often caught before it's you know yeah, as much as taught. Uh, any advice for some practical things to kind of revitalize that fire inside? Absolutely. <clears throat> there, there are two two. I'm, I'm answering on two levels here. First of all, for a congregation. You know, because that's going to just be a common thing, a common occurrence. And leaders, pastors and stuff, need to recognize that. So there should never be another year go by without you having at least one 30-day prayer emphasis. And there, there are, I mean, there are stacks and stacks of great resources out there. You've written them, I've written them. You know, uh, 30 days of prayer for this, or 30 days of prayer for this, or 40 days of prayer for this, or... 21 days to prepare for this, but but you have a focus where the whole congregation has a little devotional. They're reading it. They're praying together. It's going to teach them some things, and they'll grow in their prayer life together. What it does, typically, is it simply raises the water level of prayer in the church a little bit. You know, just just kind of grows a little bit. Not some big spike or anything, but it just together, they'll all grow a little bit in prayer. And they feel good knowing that others are doing this. And actually, they feel guilty not being a part of it because they know the whole church is, is going through that. And so, so I really believe that one of the things, uh, whether you're preaching on prayer during that or not, it's not the issue. The fact is because there's a recognition that everybody needs to grow in prayer and that most of us don't feel good about our prayer life. You need to have that some type of prayer emphasis where it's a daily personal prayer time. Second thing, of course, for the individual. I continue, after all these years, I mean, I've been walking with Jesus for a long, long time, uh, and I still look for great books on prayer, ones that encourage me, one that build me up, one that get me go, gets me going, you know, and, and sometimes they are the daily devotional sort of thing, but many times they're simply a good, there's so many good little books. Uh, Andrew Murray wrote in the 1800s uh, <clears throat> on prayer. You know, I've read all of Andrew Murray's over and over again. You take people like uh, a little more recent, still older, uh, like Tozer and, and Tory, uh, and, and their books on prayer, you know, and the list could go on of some of the classics on prayer that have been such an encouragement to me. Even, even today, uh, uh, Ronnie Floyd has a great book on, on prayer that I encourage people uh, to get uh, learning to love to pray uh, by Alvin Vandegren. So many great books that are out there. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm always pushing people towards those uh, because I think, well, I know. No, it's, just, it's not just a think sort of thing. I know because I, I know in my own life over and over and over again, if prayer begins to just start to slide down a bit, I pick up one of those books and I am on fire again. I mean, I am moving. Uh, Wesley Duell wrote a book called A Blaze for God, and that's what it does. I mean, it, it sets you ablaze for God. You know, and I love those sort of books 
that that bring an encouragement to people. So look for those. And by the way, a lot of those are for free out online. You can, you can find them out online. Some of the older ones it doesn't cost you anything, and you can read them online, and you don't have to worry about carrying a book around. <laughs> hey, and hey, maybe it's a good shift here. Hey, you've you've written a few things uh, over the years on on prayer as well. Uh, I, I I was looking at your uh, your bio this morning again, just to kind of get. And one of the topics that uh, you you write on is uh, and talk about is spiritual warfare. Uh, hmm. And I, I, now this is, has two purposes. One, uh, I feel God's leading me at some point to write my own book on spiritual warfare. So since you already written one, written one I figured I'd, I'd, I'd ask you a couple of questions, <laughs> but also, okay. uh, but yeah. also uh, just because uh, I think it's one of those topics that can maybe scare people uh, when it comes to uh, prayer and things like that. I was, at a church recently and a question and answer time at the end. And one of the first questions was about, you know, Daniel's, uh, uh, the, the angels coming in those spiritual warfare of Daniel uh, nine or 10 or whatever. Uh, so if you were to, let's, let's go back to that 20 year old who has just found Christ. Uh, what would you give them as a, something they need to know about spiritual warfare that would help them in their actual, you know, just kind of a practical, here's something you need to know that will help you with your spiritual journey on the subject of spiritual warfare. Does that make sense? Sure. You mean besides having them read my book? Right, right. No, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, well, we want them to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. No, I think it's very, very important. And by the way, let me just say too, uh, I wrote, my, the first book I ever wrote was uh, The Devil Goes to Church. Uh, and uh, which is prayer, spiritual warfare. Uh, people love the title. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I tell them, you know, yeah, the devil goes to church sometimes more than our church members. Uh, <laughs> it makes sense because that's where he can create disruption. That's where he can, can that's where his greatest uh, danger is, is in the church. And we don't often think of that. But interesting, I wrote that because as I was traveling, just like you said, and I would open up after a seminar for questions without exception questions on spiritual warfare came up. You can't really teach on prayer adequately without dealing with spiritual warfare. I, I love John Piper's line, until we know that life is war, we won't know what prayer is for. Wow. You know, that's, that's powerful. You know, and that's exactly where I found myself saying, wow, I need to, I need to put something down in this because I, as I develop more and more answers for people on this, I realized I need to be teaching on it. It needs to be a book I can put in people's hands. But, and here's where the answer is, it needs to have a balance. And the balance is the balance I see in the life of Jesus. Jesus obviously was involved in spiritual warfare. I mean, everywhere he went, you know, demons popped up. Okay, they, they really, but, but understand, Jesus didn't have a deliverance ministry. Jesus' focus was on the kingdom of God. That's what he preached. That was his proclamation. The kingdom of God is among you. It's here. It's now. That's because the king was there. They just didn't recognize it. But it was all about the kingdom. Now, if a demon had the audacity to interrupt him, he turned and dealt with him. But then he came right back and focused on the kingdom. You see, that's the kind of balance that I think we need to have in the church. We do need to know how to deal with the demonic. We do need to know how to deal with, with those sort of interruptions, if you will. But we need to not focus on it. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the, that book that I wrote, The Devil Goes to Church, the foreword is by Henry Blackaby. And, and Henry, as a, as, as a good old Southern Baptist, was not going to write a foreword for a book that was wild and woolly and strange, <laughs> focused on the devil. But it's a book that focuses on Christ overcoming the devil, and that's how we do that. That's how we win in this. The simplest thing that I tell anyone in spiritual warfare, in prayer, and this is something I do every day, and I still do, is I put on the armor of God. It's interesting, in Ephesians chapter 6, that great teaching of Paul on spiritual warfare, clearer than anywhere else, 
spiritual warfare literally starts in Genesis and goes to Revelation. You see it everywhere. But Paul in Ephesians 6 teaches it clearer. And in the, in the midst of his teaching on prayer, he said, put on the arm, full armor of God so that you can take your stand. And then he goes through and he talks about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the Lord, your, the word of God. And, and so what I simply do every morning is put on the armor of God in prayer. It's interesting, that old uh, hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Third verse, put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. And, and I think you got it right, that, that we simply do that in prayer. You know, someone tried to get spiritual with me one time and said, well, you know, I put on the, the armor, but I never took it off. I don't need to do that every day. And I said, oh, <clears throat> good for you. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're so spiritual. You know, but as for me, I desperately need that every day. Because when I put on the armor, I'm reminded I'm about to walk into the battle. Every day is a battle. So I, I'm putting on the armor reminds me that, that, uh, that I'm about to walk into a battle. Secondly, every piece of the armor corresponds to Jesus. Every piece of the armor is about Jesus. His very name means, you know, God is my salvation. He, he is, you know, our, our, our shield of faith. He is our breath. He is the word of God. I mean, each of these things. And so all I'm doing is being clothed with Christ, which is what Scripture says, by the way, put on Christ daily. You know, I always ask people, how do you do that? You know, if scripture gives us a command for a reason. So I put on Christ daily by putting on the armor of God. Not my armor, it's his armor. I put on the armor of God and I'm being clothed with Christ and I walk in his strength and walk in his victory. You see, I would teach my, my boys that when they were going to school to put on their armor before they go there. I can teach a brand new Christian that. I can teach a child. I can teach a 90-year-old. Put on the armor of God, and ultimately you have the basics for walking in victory right there. Well, that's that's so good because uh, so much of spiritual warfare teaching, which is why I'm even hesitant to at some point write a book because it gets it into the spirit of weird and almost <laughs> at that point uh, that you like okay nah, I don't want to go down that road, but <laughs> I. I Especially, especially in my circles. But uh, if uh, we're kind of rounding the corner to land the plane here pretty soon, but uh, I wanted to get a, a couple uh, you know, more in here. Uh, first, is there any, when you look at your own habits, because that was a great habit that you have every morning to get up. Uh, is there any habits that the last few years you've added to your life that have been beneficial to your spiritual walk? Anything that comes to mind that you maybe, maybe you picked up from somebody else or something that you just for need sake, you added in like, Oh, this is a spiritual habit that's been beneficial to me. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> the most important for me, and I learned from someone else uh, is that while I'm getting myself ready physically, I get myself ready spiritually. It's a very simple thing to do. And it, it because it's logical because it, and I'm putting it at the right place. It's at the beginning of the day. You know, I don't, I don't go through the day and then brush my teeth. You can all be grateful. <laughs> uh, I brush my teeth and, and I shave and I shower and I get dressed and I do all of those things right at the beginning of the day. So while I'm getting ready physically, I'm getting ready spiritually. It's during that time. And, and, you know, I've talked to my wife. She knows, you know, that, that's, that's kind of my time there, just to kind of focus on, on the Lord. And so there are certain things that I, that I pray about during that time. It's not a, it's not, I have no, I have no list. I have no ritual. There's nothing I have to do during that time. It's just a matter of getting myself ready spiritually. So, so I do put on the armor of God. Uh, I do ask the Lord to, to make me a man of prayer that day. I ask him to teach me to pray. Uh, I, I mean, there's just a lot of things. I, I pray, uh, I pray during that time for open ears spiritually to be able to hear what God wants to say to me. I pray for open eyes spiritually that I can see Him and see what He wants me to see through the day. I pray for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. 
uh, again, every day. You know, I always go back to, to, to uh, Dwight L. Moody when someone complained the fact that he, came, he preached like three nights in a row on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and some ladies, you know, complained to him afterwards. And said, why do you keep saying being filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, well, because, madam, I, I leak. <laughs> uh, that, that's kind of the way I feel sometimes. So I keep on a daily basis, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Uh, may your Holy Spirit lead me on level ground. That's a scripture from the Psalms, you know, to pray that. Uh, keep me from willful sin today. I, I love to, to incorporate into my morning prayer, uh, particularly from the Psalms, I find a number of things that I find myself praying uh, that have to do with preparing myself for the day, for, for a life of intimacy, uh, a life of open eyes and ears, um, of being led by the Spirit and, and doing what He wants on the day. I, I take that day and I lay it before Him because most of my days are filled with stuff, activities, <laughs> people, calls, you know, meetings. Uh, but I want to be able to say, Lord, if there's one of those or all of them that I need to just cancel, you know, I want, I want to do that. I'm more interested in pleasing you than my schedule. And so, uh, so that's become... I would say the most significant habit for me in my life. That's a, that's such great uh, practice and thinking through. Uh, anyone can kind of make their own routine based on that. And that's, yeah. uh, I, but it gives you some just some good stuff to think about. I we, my last question is always uh, where can people find and you know, that kind of stuff. So we'll get to that in just a second. But I, mm-hmm. I since you I. I you have you hear about what God is doing around the country, probably more so than the average person, just with the nature of <laughs> things. Uh, wh- what uh, from this uh, from the prayer movement, or just in general, you see God doing some things. Or is there anything that really is exciting you, or or even from your own work? Uh, what, what what's what's the most exciting part of what you're uh, doing these days that kind of be like, wow, I'm glad God gets, let's, do, let's me do this. <laughs> yeah. Oh my. I, I know the trouble is there's, there's <laughs> many. I mean, honestly, God is on the move. People need to understand. We get depressed. Sometimes we look at the things around us. We look at what's happening in our nation and around the world and we get d- depressed, but God is moving. He is on his throne. Nothing is taking him unaware. And so he has a movement of prayer that is reaching, uh, the lost. And, you know, there is a, a go day that's happening in May of 2020 that is going to be an extraordinary through that month of, of praying for the lost and, and reaching out. That's going to be tremendously exciting. There is a gathering uh, on July 4th of 2020 uh, of probably 100,000 teenagers uh, in, uh, in the middle of, of the country who are going to be gathering under a uh, claim your campus and, uh, and, and, talking about how to reach their campuses for Jesus Christ. And I'm excited by that. And we're, we're praying, I mean, literally have a meeting next week uh, of, of preparing for that in prayer and what are we going to do? You know, a lot of us right now are really upset, angry, whatever, by some of the decisions in New York and Illinois and stuff regarding uh, uh, abortion. Uh, there is an astonishing new movie coming out uh, in March called Unplanned that that God, I believe, is going to use. It's undergirded with prayer. They, they had people praying 24 hours a day on the set. They're just covering this in prayer, that God would use this movie to save millions of lives. And I love when this, this sort of, of direct action and prayer comes together, and you see then the power of God that's put in there. I'm excited by that. I, I, Kevin, I could go on and on. I'll tell you one more thing. And that is we have a kind of a soft launch. It's just getting going uh, of a national prayer strategy that the National Prayer Committee is releasing called Pray Beyond. We just want everyone to be a part of Pray Beyond. It's a challenge to pray beyond where you've been, to pray beyond the way you've done it before, pray beyond your traditions, pray beyond your denomination, pray beyond your politics, pray beyond your fears, pray beyond your hurts, pray beyond your nation, pray beyond your imagination. And I'm excited by what God's going to do with that. 
Very cool. Uh, so if people were wanting to uh, uh, harvest prayer ministry, your work, uh, find all your books, uh, uh, can you give them uh, the places to go or, and any final ask that you have of the audience, what you, uh, I mean, whatever, and the sky's the limit if you want to sign them for an email address. I don't care. <laughs> you know, to me, the, the most important would be to be aware of our website, harvestprayer.com. Because at harvestprayer.com, you can, you can sign up for a daily free devotional. It's going to come to you every day if you want to do that. There are hundreds of articles that are free, downloadable things to help with your prayer life. There are a list of our books and where they're available, how to find those. It's also going to be a place where you can sign up to get a, a, a newsletter that comes out every six weeks or so. It's going to give you information about the prayer movement and how to pray. What you're going to continue to hear, and this would be how I would close this, is to challenge you to pray beyond. See, everybody can do that. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your prayer life has been, you can pray beyond where you've been. You can do more. Pray beyond is what God is calling the church to do today so that his power can be poured out and we'll see another great awakening in this nation. Oh, that's great. I will, and that will all be in the show notes for people who are wanting to uh, find out more and uh, harvestprayer.com. And we'll have, uh, hopefully, lots of people will uh, join this movement to pray beyond. Uh, Dave, I just appreciate you being on the show today. I, I appreciate you and Kim, and uh, you've been a blessing in my life. And so I'm, I just want to say that again. I'm just great, grateful for you and uh, your your blessing to me personally and to the prayer movement. So thanks for being on the show today. Oh, thank you, Kevin. It's been my privilege. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and found something practical that you could pull away uh, for your own prayer life, your own journey with God. Yeah, it's got some good stuff in there. Hey, if you want to find out more about his books or uh, some of the books he referenced, uh, why don't you come on over to ChristConnection.cc slash podcast, uh, where we'll have all the show notes there. Uh, I list out uh, the books that he mentioned, things like that. So uh, again, that's ChristConnection.cc slash podcast. Uh, you can find us on online uh, at uh, Enjoying Prayer for Twitter and Christ Connection for uh, Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but again, the website, we'd love to find lots of resources and things for your journey with God there, and that is ChristConnection.cc or EnduringPrayer.org. Either one of those will get you there. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed that conversation, and until next time, thanks for listening.